uh, I would, hello everyone. I would like uh, to welcome all of you for joining us today. Um, we hope you are all staying safe and well during these uncertain times. I am Victoria Ravis, one of three NYU Aging Incubator co-directors alongside Joshua Chadosh and Bei Wu. If this is your first time hearing about the NYU Aging Incubator, I'd like to briefly take a moment to tell you a little bit about our initiative. The Aging Incubator was established in 2016 as a university-wide initiative to bring together faculty and students from across all disciplines in the university who are involved in the study of aging and its impact on society. Uh, the Aging Incubator tries to be a resource for the NYU community to both grow research, educational activities, events, and resources for all who work in the aging field uh, or are interested in doing so. We're committed to improving the health and well being of older adults through uh, innovative and interdisciplinary research, policy development, and educational endeavors. On behalf of the NYU Aging Incubator team, I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Fidel Lim, who is a clinical associate professor at NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing and a fellow of the Aging Incubator. In this presentation, Dr. Lim will highlight the unique healthcare patterns and trajectories of older adults who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. Ways to support this community will be explored and discussed. A question and answer session will be held during the last 15 minutes of our webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to give Dr. Lim a few minutes to introduce himself before he begins his talk. Dr. Lim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raviz. Uh, this is indeed a, a, a pleasure and an honor for me to do this presentation. I've done some of these uh, related LGBT uh, Q health nursing presentation, but this is one uh, special for me because I, I, I'm interested in aging, partly um, uh, as I tell my students, I'm becoming a, a, a specimen of my own lectures because I'm also closer to that uh, cohort. So a little bit about myself. I am a nursing faculty. I've been at NYU for the past 26 years. I'm an, alum, I'm an alum as well at NYU. So I, I um, I like being at NYU and this is um, uh, home for me. So I'll jump into the presentation. Uh, feel free to type in your questions and uh, comments in the Q&A and we'd love to hear from you as well uh, as we go along. So the flow of the presentation, uh, I, I like to just give you a background of what we're going to uh, talk about today. I'd like to mention why LGBT aging and addressing the health issues is important. The present day influences of aging and LGBT aging, which leads to the context of understanding LGBT aging, the, the social, social forces that affects. And then those uh, unique health disparities that we see in this population, alongside with the other common well-known um, health issues, and then talk a little bit about the framework, how we can address LGBT health. I know in the participants are from multi disciplines and you have expertise and experiences in a lot of different aspects of healthcare. Mine is nursing. And then we'll talk about research, education, practice and policy implication. So let's start off by uh, answering the question. Uh, why do we need to address LGBT aging? And why is this important uh, to all of us? Well, uh, the main thing I, I'd like to say is that healthcare issues really appear, appears later in life, right? The, the, the major consumer of healthcare are older adults. Okay? So when we think about all those mortality morbidities that affect us all, uh, it's you see that the, the aging uh, population are really uh, the biggest consumer. And we know they're comorbidities, but in the LGBT uh, older adult population, they have very unique health scenarios that are not found in the heterosexual counterparts. And we're gonna talk about that and that creates a little bit of uh, health difference or uh, health disparity that we're going to talk about later on. If we do the right thing, we would reduce uh, disease transmission. And some of those we'll talk about later on. 
the progression of uh, diseases and ultimately reducing the burden of well-known comorbidities, right? So because uh, you could have heart failure at the same time dealing with the uh, psychosocial issues. And if we follow the evidence, we would increase mental and physical well-being and ultimately quality of life for us all to enjoy a long, healthy life and uh, reduce healthcare costs. So uh, these are all well known to us. Uh, we will bring a little nuance on how LGBT aging uh, affects us all. So right now in our uh, world, um, we are experiencing um, the COVID pandemic, but really uh, we are dealing with simultaneous crisis. So uh, different terminology has been offered that twin demic uh, between uh, COVID and uh, social uh, justice issues. Uh, somebody had suggested the word polydemic, right? So in this screen, you could see uh, COVID pandemic is affecting all our personal and professional lives. And so uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement of the ongoing uh, discussion on the uh, social justice issues that we deal with. These are not new, but if you put in the, the lives of the subsegment of LGBT ad older adults who uh, identify as minorities, racial ethnic minorities, you can see how this can become a little complicated. So the vaccine issue, as you know, uh, the number of vaccination in the community affects the vaccination in older adults. Um, what happens in, in the White House ultimately affects our own homes and nursing homes. So all the discussion is not fully detached when we think about the political um, uh, influences. And then the uh, report that uh, loneliness is in epidemic proportion, and this is happening already before COVID. So what COVID made, made it percolate up to the surface a little bit more. And this is uh, nursing homes patients are dying of loneliness. I took this from a New York Times uh, article headline highlighting that uh, the uh, morbidity um, consequences, mortality consequences of is isolation, social isolation and loneliness. So when we look at LGBT aging, older adults, uh, well, I want to provide some of the context uh, where they had been and where they're going to. So uh, Lavender Scare in, in, uh, in the 1950s, that moral panic of uh, being outed and being driven out of, of their jobs, you know, from the federal government, from the Eisenhower um, uh, government and, and all of that really impacted the way uh, those uh, young adults uh, interpret their uh, uh, social scenarios in terms of outing. And then on June 28, 1969, the Stonewall uh, uh, riots um, uh, happened, which is uh, influenced by the uh, civil rights movement and uh, the uh, feminist movement and uh, the other social forces at the time. Uh, made it a, a significant um, uh, gateway to uh, LGBT rights. But between 1969 and now, uh, it, it took a while for many of these things to become actually uh, changed, right? And uh, DSM uh, catalog of uh, disorders, uh, when it was put out, I think in 1952, uh, homosexuality was up there along with schizophrenia, right? And then I like to say that in 1973, there was a massive cure. They cured homosexuality because they removed it from the book, right? So, and this is a double-edged sword when we think about mental health disparities. You being in the book allows for reimbursement. Removing it from the book uh, also affects the, uh, the reimbursement process of certain uh, mental health issues. So in the last incarnation of DSM in 2015, I believe, they removed uh, gender identity disorder, and now we still have gender dysphoria. So uh, those of you who are specializing in mental health, this, would, this is of, of significance. Um, and then in 1981, the AIDS uh, uh, epidemic uh, came about, and this has uh, influenced 
massive influence in the way we do things now, even in our current pandemic. So uh, December 1st was the uh, past two days ago, uh, World AIDS Day. I looked at how many people have been lost all over the world from the AIDS pandemic, 36 million people since 1981. In the past 40 years, 36 million people have died. Now, I want to think about this. If there was no AIDS pandemic, the 36 million people would, might still be here, many of them. If they, had, uh, if they were around 30 years old at that time, they would be around 70 years old now. So the population of the aging uh, cohort would be a lot higher, right? Had, had we not had the, the AIDS epidemic. This is a significant in the uh, um, context of advocacy. You know, before the AIDS pandemic, uh, old uh, LGBT communities were se seen as, you know, people who just took care of themselves, the hedonistic lifestyles and so on. And then this has changed uh, the advocacy. Uh, Anthony Fauci was, was already there at that time. And, um, you know, he's still around here and the, the different trajectories of these. So um, I can go on and on with this, but I'll, I'll move on to the other items. So a criminalization of homosexuality. So laws change, but um, interpretation and actual behavior of police enforcement is always a little different from what the law is saying, right? So experiences of violence continues to uh, uh, be around with us. So we live in a, a heterosexist universe, binary, black, white, male, female, young, old, that sort of thing. So even though uh, uh, the uh, public uh, acceptance of LGBT uh, persons is changing and be, being more positive, it doesn't always mean that's that universal, right? So there's the legal discrimination, uh, different aspects of our uh, life and health, you know, insurance, employment, etc. And we're talking about US the world as well. And in 2015, I think 2013, I can't remember when um, um, gay marriage uh, uh, was legalized, uh, we're seeing a new pattern of uh, newlyweds, right? They tend to be older. Um, so this is uh, of significance to LGBT older adults because of the uh, trajectory for the future, who's going to take care of you. And one of the biggest uh, uh, source of care provision of older adults are adult children of older people, especially female children. So that becomes a problem if you don't have any children, right? So uh, that's also impact social isolation. So the uh, HIV AIDS uh, continues to uh, impact uh, LGBT cohort, particularly men having sex with men, right? Uh, we'll see some data in a little bit. Um, and transgender older adults have special unique uh, scenario, health scenarios because of uh, hormone use. So either uh, you know, testosterone or just estrogen uh, hormones that uh, might lead to cardiovascular uh, complications uh, later in life, hyperlipidemia, atherosclerosis. So um, that becomes a, uh, an, an added burden as we age because of the normal aging process uh, changing with atherosclerosis and other issues. LGBT elders are less likely to have children. So uh, the, uh, the trajectory of the family of choice and caregiving as well affect this. And there's some slides that speaks about that. And then put that all together and um, translate it into uh, the physical consequences, the health consequences of that. So the expert are saying that this is really the result of minority stress, okay? It's a, a concept that's been taken uh, from the uh, ethnic minority uh, research. It's been extrapolated into uh, other minority status as well. So being female, being LGBT, and being non-binary, that sort of thing. So. Um, Due to the homonegative environment, uh, sexual minorities uh, will experience chronic psychosocial stress. So there's increased allostatic load, okay? Your glucocorticoids, your uh, catecholamines, and all of that affects your stress response. So the discordant values between the uh, LGBT uh, cohorts and the dominant societal framework results in um, negative health outcomes most notably mental health. I'd like also 
for us to consider the cardiovascular consequences of these, right? So um, someone who is experiencing a lot of minority stress might do uh, unhealthy behavior, such as smoking, lack of sleep, and um, um, lack of uh, follow-up with their own health care. So the stress of living in the shadow is really quite uh, making a large impact on uh, whether you survive a certain condition or not. Um, and talking about numbers, uh, as it's always important if you're trying to you know, convince people to put up progr programs for these or fund research on this, uh, how many people will be impacted by this? So on December 1st, the US population you can see on the slide. And according to research, there are about 17% of the uh, US population are over 65. So that's 56 million, 604, et cetera. And based on the current numbers, uh, the green uh, graph from 2020, saying that we have 5.6% of uh, the population are uh, LGBT or identify as LGBT. We are looking at about approximately 3.1 million LGBT people over 65 years old. That's, that's a lot of numbers, right? So it's difficult to wrap our brains around these numbers, but I want you to consider where you work. If say you have a hospital with 500 beds, or if you're in a nursing home, 5.6% of those patients, residents there might be LGBT or identify as, think about your co coworkers as well, right? So your, your colleagues. The trend between 2012 and 2020 from 3.5 to 5.6, there's, there's a, a sort of conundrum with this. Is this a true shift in numbers? Are we actually seeing more numbers or are the numbers being skewed by younger adults identifying as LGBT more than older adults, those over 65? Because the, the tendency of older adults is uh, there is a notion that they might not be openly identifying themselves. So the Gallup poll of 2020 uh, tells us the distribution. So we, we stop at LGBT and a little bit of Q in there. There's other um, alphabets in there like A and uh, intersex, et cetera, but uh, we don't have data. But I uh, want to point out uh, the bisexual population, 54.6%. So. Uh, many of uh, people uh, sometimes overlook that, that it's, it's actually higher than uh, those who identify as lesbian and gay. And um, that's an interesting uh, thing because there's not much known about them, uh, or at least they, uh, the, the patterns that are not as well known as in gay research and lesbian research. Um, LGBT by generation, this is Gallup poll 2020. So, the baby boomers, um, nine, born between 46 and 64, right? So you could see uh, the numbers in here, right? So they are less likely to identify, but if you look at Generation Z, the numbers are really significantly higher, right? So uh, the, the future healthcare providers, social workers, physicians, uh, dentists, uh, we will be seeing more and more of these and it's it's we're seeing it now but uh this is going to change dramatically in the future so lgbt identification is lower in each of the older generation so does that mean that we have fewer in them or is are they less likely to identify or self-identify because of fear of being outed right uh, the looming uh, fear that they might be treated otherwise if they identify as LGBT, say, in a uh, nursing home. U.S. adults and LGBT adults' marital status. So being in stable, loving, secure, and safe relationship affects health. Right? I think everybody knows that. And there's evidence that people who are in uh, uh, happy marriages have, are, are, healthy, are healthier than those who are not. So among the LGBT population, uh, 9.6 married to same-sex spouse. But I would like also to point out among the LGBT adults uh, living with opposite-sex domestic partner, 
So that's also high. So what I'm trying to say here is not everybody uh, is living with the same um, sex uh, partner, even though they might identify as LGBT, right? Living with uh, same sex domestic partner, 67.1, okay? So there are uh, people who identify as LGBT, but married to the opposite sex, particularly among bisexuals. So uh, this requires a sort of recalibration in the way we see uh, our uh, patients because yeah, th this uh, preconce preconceived notion of who should be married to who. And now the leading cause of death in the US uh, 2021, I put this data here because uh, this graph table here, because they have added COVID here. COVID-19, according to the JAMA um, art article, is one to the third leading cause of death in 2020. Okay? Now, we know that the majority of these 345,223, when they recorded this, are older adults living with diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. So uh, the point I want to uh, say here is, is it different if you had COVID and you identify as transgender? Okay. Are there differences in the outcomes? Uh, what, what, is, what is the difference, right? And um, so I don't know the answer to those. I'm, I'm throwing it out there to, uh, to make us think about this. Uh, when we look at the health disparity, you can see why this is, uh, this is uh, a lot more uh, complex. Okay, so what are those health disparities? Okay, LGBT older adults are now, are known to avoid or delay medical care. Right, about two thirds of them have experienced victimization at least three times in their lives. So the the, the way they see the world might be different. So um, and they might have been victimized by uh, uh, by the system. Right, um, more than half reported uh, discriminated against employment. Okay, and there's this whole thing that they think that the care they receive is inferior, not as good as the other person who does not identify. So something for us to think about as healthcare providers, right? Um, I, me as a nurse, for example, I think of it this way. If I have six patients assigned to me and one of them is transgender, do I visit that room less frequently than my heterosexual patient counterpart? Um, if you are a social worker, what's your interaction, the length of time, those types of things, because they, they perceive that they are not receiving the same level of quality of care. Uh, and high rates of isolation, loneliness. We've heard this loneliness, isolation is similar to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. LGBT population have higher smoking rates to begin with, right? Um, and that becomes a, a important for a cardiovascular health. health. Repeated experiences of discrimination can le lead to long-term negative health outcomes. Allostatic load from hypervigilance, from fear of being uh, discriminated, from the experience of being LGBT, rather than just being LGBT itself, is, is, is really quite stressful for some of these uh, populations. So, Higher rates of poor physical health and mental health, we, we understand. And here's another one, disability is higher compared with heterosexual counterparts. And then the discussion of the uh, ongoing AIDS uh, epidemic, right? 17% um, of all new infections are among 50, uh, age 50 and older. So that's, that's, that's a good, that's a, that's a, that's a good a high number, I, I think. Um, for, for a very long time, uh, 50,000 new infection, it has reduced to about 36, I believe, in the last count. So there are improvements, but um, something to think about, why do we have 17% of all those people who may have lived through uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic and still getting exposed? Is this, what, what, is the, what is the background of that, right? So, um, and when we think, of the connection between HIV infection and neurocognitive disorder, dementia, HIV dementia. Now you can see why this is a little more complicated when we think of older adults comorbid with HIV AIDS. 48% uh, of same-sex couples experience adverse treatment in housing, right? So uh, insecure housing, one third live or below poverty line, right? So um, 
great part of uh, elder care is really a lot of this is self-pay. If you don't have the economic resources for that, that's that stuff, right? One in three LGBT people smoke more than heterosexual and general population, right? So there is no biological explanation for this, right? This is the experience of being LGBT makes someone take on unhealthy practices, right? So, uh, and that's very important. So when we talk about uh, uh, motivational interviewing, that sort of thing, significantly more likely to drink alcohol. So you combine smoking, substance, alcohol use, you could see LGBT health is cardiovascular health, right? And of course, the mental health issues is, is there as well. 39% of LGBT elders have contemplated uh, uh, self-harm, suicide, and two of every five transgender people have actually attempted suicide in their lifetime. The most negative outcomes among the transgender population are among those who are Black transgender female. Okay, so that's that's something that uh, beyond the scope of this conversation today, is something to, to think about. This is about the disability, which I already uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, I won't you know, explain this, but there is a higher uh, disability rate and victimization, especially physical assault among uh, certain LGBT cohorts. And social and economic uh, insecurities, right? This is a 2013 study, um, might be a bit old, but uh, could be uh, still significant to, to think about that 50% of single LGBT older people believe they will work well beyond their retirement age. Okay. So there's that fear that I may have to continue working until I'm 75, right? 42% uh, of older uh, LGBT people uh, fear they will outlive money uh, that they have saved for retirement, right? So this is that uh, stressor, another burden of thinking, you know, well, I have enough uh, to live on uh, from the time I retire. That's enough to uh, make your blood pressure go up, I think about sometimes myself. Um, so uh, it's just a good, you know, uh, conversation to, to think about when you interface with uh, our patient. And I'd like to share this 2020 um, report, 500 pages of understanding the well-being of LGBTQI population uh, from the National Academies. 21% uh, of older adult people have provided care to friends compared to only 6% of their heterosexual country. That is, that is, uh, that's, that's a big number out there. So who is caring for who and, and why, right? And the people who are caring for other older adults LGBT are also older adults. So I'll give you an example. I have a volunteer work at uh, Service Advocacy for Gay Elders, SAGE, okay? I'm 54 years old. I volunteer there. I have a client, a, a friend at home, it's called. I've been visiting Howard for the past nine years, once a week, okay? To give him uh, company for two hours a week, that sort of thing. A lot of the volunteers are much older than me in their 70s but they, they want to contribute to the, the well-being and uh, you know, social health of the uh, uh, homebound older adults, LGBT. So that's very important because uh, LGBT, LGBTQ adults were more likely than others to have taken time off to care for someone in their chosen family. So not the biological family. So these are family of choice. One third of LGBT elders live or below 200% of the poverty level. So if you want to care for someone, it needs resources, right? So for example, when I go visit uh, my friend at home, you know, I, I bring a little cookie, I bring a little something there. So uh, I'm not expected to, but I, I, I do because I want to. So caring for somebody at home who is uh, dealing with a lot of healthcare issues is, is tough, right? And it needs money. So what are we going to do about this? So what's the framework for uh, addressing the uh, LGBT aging? So this uh, slide, I uh, took this from the NIH uh, IOM, National Academies. Uh, we want to conceptualize LGBT aging. Um, this is a very flexible framework. You can apply this in just about anything, okay? Think about minority stress, which we already said. 
uh, what it does to your uh, psychosocial, physical health. And then life course uh, view. So what happens to us as children affects in the next developmental stage. What happens to us as older adults will affect you know, the next stage and so on. So there's a whole connectivity of that. Intersectionality, I, I, I often ask my students, have you ever wondered what became of the patient who left the hospital, okay? You discharge a patient from the emergency room. Did you ever wonder what happened to them at home? Because you could provide the best care in the hospital, but the moment they leave, the place, what happens next, right? Because so, we don't live in a bubble. We, 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 we have multiple intersections of our identities, right? And that counts for social ecology. So um, you go home, you're a mother, you're a father, you're a worker, you're, you're a caregiver, etc. So all of these uh, effects, you know, how you identify yourself in terms of uh, sexual orientation, gender identity is just but one identity. Right? There are many, many multiple intersections, your socioeconomic identity, your professional identity, uh, and so on. All right, so uh, application to practice. And uh, again, we could be here all day talking about how, uh, how we can uh, improve care. So for those of us who are clinicians, right? Uh, data collection is something we see now. We have, uh, you know, um, collect uh, gender identity and sexual orientation in the health, electronic health record, uh, staff training and support. This is becoming more and more common. I think many of the ho local hospitals, uh, at least from two places that I'm connected with, there's annual LGBT training. If you work for uh, Health and Human Corporation, they're the first one who started this about 10 years ago, I believe. Um, everybody has to be trained from the housekeeper to the CEO on LGBT health. LGBT affirming environment, the, the nursing unit, the waiting room, the, the, the lobby of the hospital. And we're talking about physical environment. We'll think about this, uh, the, uh, the, the atmosphere of the environment, right? What, what is in your waiting lounge? Right? What kind of magazines do you have there? Do you have the rainbow flag in there? Do you have um, uh, things that uh, might be welcoming to uh, the LGBT population? Uh, healthcare equality index, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, community partnerships, because of the whole idea that our patients don't live in the hospital, right? They, they go back to their communities. We have to know what the community is doing and the hospital can partner with them. Uh, uh, brochures of uh, skilled nursing facility, right? You could see now, um, you know, sometimes uh, couples of the same gender, same sex, uh, you know, in, in those brochures, uh, Gay Pride celebration. I had a memorable experience. I, I took my students to the Hebrew home uh, in Riverdale. And this is maybe about seven, eight years ago. And at the time we were there, they were doing their first ever Gay Pride celebration in the Hebrew home in Riverdale. Everybody was nervous. So they put out the word out there, we're gonna have a, an event at 12 noon. And everybody was on the edge. Well, people show up you can be sure there were about 60 people who showed up in there, right? So they didn't know. Wow, I didn't realize that this is something that the uh, residents would, would take pride. So nowadays, this is commonplace, right? You have um, gay pride celebration in uh, skilled nursing facilities. Some um, have even specific dedicated unit for LGBT. Again, that's another discussion. So uh, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Um, healthcare Equality Index. So here's a website in there and slides will be shared with everybody later on to uh, check out your local facility. Have they met the four standards of uh, core measures of LGBTQ friendly uh, healthcare facilities? So um, this is publicly reported. This is a, a voluntary uh, uh, sign up for the institution. It's published every year. Uh, you can see Langone is in there as met all the index. So this is something to um, look into. And um, the next slide talks about public attitude towards aging and sexual and gender minorities around the world, right? So um, we are more and more globalized than we can ever imagine. Um, 
And many of our uh, patients in this uh, part of the US, New York in the area are uh, immigrants or from uh, uh, transplant to, to where we are. So what happens in the world also in, impacts us. So according to this data from 2017, um, those uh, around the world, uh, this is a, a large study, ages 55, uh, they asked them, this is general population, not LGBT, right? Uh, this is everybody on there. They asked them, do you know someone who is uh, a sexual minority or who identify as sexual minority? So that is LGBTQ, okay? So only 41% uh, said yes. Um, and from the gender identity minority, only 32%. But in the US, we seem to have a higher number, okay? Uh, 54% uh, of those of us who are over 65 and between 55 and 64, even higher, 67%. So uh, what what is the reason for this? Is it because we, we have better um, exposure about these things? So, um, and this impacts uh, um, the care we give, because we know that when someone uh, knows someone who is LGBTQ, they are more likely to have positive attitudes toward LGBT, LGBTQ population. So when we consider our workers, right, the direct care providers, the home attendant, uh, the, the the grocery people, the the delivery, the food delivery people. This 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 is this is significant, right? Um, um, part of this study, I don't have that slide. Is uh, people from uh, South Central America knows uh, have higher numbers. They 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 tend to they seem to know more people who identify as sexual uh, minority orientation, sexual minority orientation, and gender identity. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, uh, information. So knowing someone makes a difference. Uh, at SAGE Service Advocacy for Gay Elders, they have this uh, event uh, that sometimes gather people of multi-generation to, to gather around and have a meal, okay? Um, the pandemic has sort of uh, stopped some of these things. So, um, but this would be a great uh, thing. So when I uh, visit Howard at home, um, he was hospitalized for 17 days in June, um, and I went every day, and uh, my the nurse and me, of course, um, I brought a little and dust ice cream, one for him and one for me. He doesn't have diabetes, but here I am. My blood sugar was going up because I was eating ice cream, which I never do, and uh, but it made him, you know, eat better uh, because I was keeping him company. So, uh, and so when the staff sees this, it influences them. Right, so they, they understood that, wow, well, Howard is single, he doesn't have anybody, but here's somebody who's not a family, who goes in there and takes time. So there's something about that, right? So it, it gives this uh, whole uh, 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 psychosocial uh, hope that, yeah, it, it's, it's, you can do this, right? Um, so for the researchers in the gathering today, all right? I don't know if uh, some of you are already doing this. I am not a researcher. My background is as a clinician. I was a night shift nurse for 19 and a half years. And I, 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 I did one uh, research in my DNP and that's uh, the curriculum of uh, BSN curriculum and LGBT health. But those of you who are in, in the realm of uh, research. So what the expert is saying is we need more cross-sectional and longitudinal research especially uh, exploring demographic, demographic realities of LGBT aging with the intersections of social ecology, multiple identities and so on, okay? Uh, we need a lot more descriptive studies. Uh, counting is important, right? Counting, especially if you want to have a program somewhere in a nursing home, we, we, we need to count. Uh, family dynamics, interpersonal personal relationships between providers, staff, and among, you know, the population. Uh, healthcare utilization, mental health, um, depression, long-term hormone use. Uh, I think there are ongoing research on this. Um, what is the consequences of this? Uh, it's, we, we will know more of these as, as, as we go along. Um, 
and uh, disabilities, right? So now you identify as LGBT, that's one identity. You have a disability, you sit in a wheelchair, that's another identity. Your skin color is different, that's another identity. You live in a certain neighborhood, your zip code affects your identity. All of that, so we, we don't know so much about uh, those intersections. And education, uh, right? Uh, whatever program you are in, um, consider doing a gap assessment, right? So uh, at NYU Myers, we've done this uh, a while ago, about 10, 12 years ago. We surveyed the faculty. Uh, we, we wanted to know where, where these topics are being taught. The, uh, sometimes the challenge is trying to put this into the curriculum. The curriculum is packed, it's bursting at the seams, right? There's just no more thing to a uh, space to add in there. If you're going to add something, you're going to remove something and, and, and back and forth. So um, those of you designing curriculum, um, the question to ask is, do we really need a separate LGBTQ course, right? Or can we thread this through the entire curriculum? So I teach cardiovascular health. So I put in my demographics of who is at risk. So I put information out there. Um, in addition to the usual um, information that we know. So competency training, faculty development, right? Uh, dealing with our uh, clinical partners, our students, etc. We We might have students who are older adults who identify as LGBT, uh, assigning them clinical exposure to community organization, simulation. Everybody is doing this nowadays. Uh, at Myers, we have LGBT simulations, standardized patients. Um, this is uh, you know, great for uh, mental health training, uh, for psych um, communication. Uh, pediatrics is another uh, important, you know, talking with young adults uh, who are transgender, et cetera. Um, debriefing, clinical imagination, and just throwing out there every conversation. Okay, so you are a dentist, and now you're going to do a, uh, a, a procedure. Uh, what if that person is transgender? Is it any different? Right? Um, student interest groups, uh, partnership with uh, community-based organizations. So all of these, I, I won't uh, read this through all of you, but uh, our students, for one, they will read it if you put it in the test. <laughs> so sadly, um, so uh, that's something to think about, right? Uh, if you're designing uh, testings, um, policy implications. Okay? Now, according to uh, the uh, the studies from uh, national academies, we need more federally funded, uh, there's a typo there, federally funded uh, research of LGBT aging. Okay, we have a lot of private uh, funding and uh, other uh, resources, but we, we, we need from the federal government, uh, federal prohibition of discrimination based on sexual orientation. Okay, so still on uh, out there. Funding community-based organization, the, 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 the Affordable Health Care uh, Act, Obamacare, uh, had a lot of these, but because of the changes uh, uh, in the government, you know, programs gets closed off, et cetera. So that's another uh, issue. Accurate data collection. Yeah, uh, we want to include um, sexual orientation, gender identity uh, markers, uh, information, uh, and develop programs to address social isolation. And some of us in this gathering are doing research on that and on how do we uh, uh, support those uh, older adults who are homebound, who have no internet, who, who who are just in their own uh, you know, small little world and not, you know, getting a meaningful stimulation uh, from uh, the larger society. Okay, and then I'd like to uh, mention about uh, resilience and crisis competence. Okay, older adults in general are 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 conceived to have certain resilience competence, right? You, you've survived the depression, for example. You, you've survived uh, the, uh, the multiple comorbidities. So they, they, they're, they're, they're not helpless, that's what we're trying to say here. So there is a certain uh, uh, competence that they have developed from facing adversity. LGBT older adults may have experienced a different social uh, 
environment or uh, experience as they come of age in the 60s, that provides them a certain um, resilience competence. The AIDS epidemic has done that to many of them who have survived that, right? Because they have gone through that uh, time where they were just being, you know, uh, discriminated, ostracized from all corners and uh, being, um, uh, having a negative experience with the healthcare uh, establishment. So there's a certain hardness around them. And so when we interact with them, what might come up, come across to us as something harsh or indifferent or paranoid even, uh, we have to look at where that's coming from, right? Because you, you, you want to know how is it impacting this person's ability to live and survive and have a quality of life. So uh, the AIDS epidemic created a greater sense of community, right? Uh, one of the uh, uh, not fully acknowledged uh, uh, group that helped in the AIDS uh, epidemic was the lesbian communities, right? Um, all the gay people in, in 84, 85, 87 were all very ill. So it was the lesbians who took care of the gays, right? And um, the, the, there's a wonderful documentary movie called 5B, uh, the first AIDS hospital in uh, San Francisco. And, and they, they mention about this, it's, it's, it's not fully acknowledged. And sometimes there's contentions between the, the different, you know, alphabets, uh, LGBT and what is what and, you know. So, but uh, we, we have to acknowledge the contributions of, 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 of the minority populations in caring uh, uh, for one another. Uh, lesbians and bisexual women who themselves were considerably less likely to be infected with HIV at the time, so they were the major players, caregivers. So, uh, so what are you going to do with that information, right? When you are dealing with someone in, in, in the hospital who is dealing with heart failure, a broken hip, a pneumonia, and then they are also identifying as LGBT. Is it different? And what is the difference and what can we do about that, right? Um, so here are some resources. Uh, I'd like to uh, you know, point out some of these, uh, most of you are probably members of these, uh, American Geriatric Society, AARP. I'm a member of AARP. I get 15% discount at Denny's nowadays. <laughs> so that's a good thing. <laughs> I volunteer for the service advocacy for gay elders for the past nine years. And um, that's where I visit uh, um, a friend at home um, at the Fenway. Uh, the Joint Commission has a booklet on this uh, you can access. Um, and the GLMA, uh, there's a nursing section in this. They, they're doing a lot of uh, uh, great work and uh, you know fact sheets and what you should discuss with every uh, cohort, um, uh, LGBT uh, cancer network. Um, there are certain cancer that higher prevalence in um, a certain subsegment of the LGBT population, such as, you know, ovarian cancer or breast cancer or uh, rectal cancer and so on. Uh, God's Love We Deliver is another place that I volunteer. Uh, those of you who um, might know that God's Love We Deliver uh, came about because of the AIDS uh, epidemic, right? And they deliver uh, meals at that time when, um, you know, delivering meals or uh, uh, giving food to, to people in the hospital was, was, was rather different. I remember when I was a new nurse, I was an orientation and uh, as a nursing, as an RN in 1990, January 1990, I was on still two weeks on the job and the food trays were left outside the door of the rooms of the patient with HIV. The food delivery person did not go into that room. I can, I can tell you, it's, uh, it, it was, wow, I, I didn't know that. So, uh, of course, uh, my experience is coming from zero, no experience caring for people with AIDS to 1,000% because I had my training in the Philippines. I didn't know anything about this. Uh, so that was a, an eye-opening for me. And the Gay Men's Health Crisis also has uh, a lot of programs uh, to address not just AIDS, but uh, breast cancer, et cetera. So 
question and thought. So this picture is uh, my, me and uh, the person to my right is Howard, who is my friend at home, where service advocacy for gay elders. And I visit him once a week for the past nine years. I was there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he, uh, he knows I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this uh, uh, information. He had come to NYU with me to talk about his experience. He is 89 years old. He's got mild dementia at the moment, but he's still able to care for himself. He has survived three cancers and um, he is up and about, but he is now um, with a 24 hour home attendant. Luckily, luckily he has the resources to pay out of pocket for this because it's not covered by uh, the uh, insurance. So with that, I will, um, end my formal narration. And I would like to hear from you uh, if you have some comments or questions. Okay. Or if you're doing any research uh, that relates to LGBT aging, we would like to 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 hear uh, as well. Um, thank you, Connor. Um, I, or you have experiences with your own patients and clients. I think uh, it, it's wonderful to hear uh, uh, narratives, uh, people's experiences. The one, I mean, I, I know you're not involved in research directly, but having um, initially started in doing uh, research back when it was you know, AIDS before it became HIV as the focus, um, that really transformed um, the broader world's understanding of um, alternative sexual orientation, but it also seemed to really get the community who was affected, all the different subgroups, so to speak, uh, to coalesce together um, and advocate for a variety of different types of rights, of which healthcare was one of them. Um, do you think COVID, which because of the infection transmission rate um, uh, root rather, rather than rate, um, it is in some way being viewed differently in, in this community population because of the history of HIV AIDS? Or do you think it, it I mean, it, it's a difficult question, but it's something that I keep thinking about mm -hmm. um, as one goes along. Yeah, yeah. Uh I thought about that too. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that question, uh, uh, Dr. Raves. Um, yeah, is, 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 the, is the pandemic seen differently by the uh, uh, LGBT aging? Uh, I'd like to think that they, there, there might be a, a slight difference in the way they see this. Uh, for those uh, LGBT cohort of a certain age um, where uh, surviving the, the, the AIDS pandemic and suddenly getting COVID and at the mm -hmm. current pandemic and die of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, imagine, I, I think I, I see myself, I would be frustrated, you know, you survive the AIDS and epidemic and then you, the, the COVID got you. So the, uh, the trajectory of the uh, surviving the experience of the AIDS pandemic uh, gives a little, uh, um, what's there? There is a, a parallel. For example, masking, right? Masking. In the eighties, we were masking in the hospitals in the early nineties to go into the patient with AIDS. Why we were doing that, we had no idea. It was seen as a very negative thing, right? So um, people would, you know, do all of these globbing and whatnot. You, you're going into the room to to check the IV. Why do you need a mask? Okay, but we didn't know. So this might create a, a certain uneasiness um, in a certain population. But then again, we are dealing with a uh, explosion of uh, the uh, information about COVID in a different rate than the AIDS uh, epidemic. At that time, 
uh, research was a little bit slow in, in the AIDS pandemic. Right now, it is so fast. I mean, you open the New York Times one day, the next thing there's new information out there. When I was preparing this presentation, I, I was always referring to a study from 2014 about the effect of systemic, systemic racism and LGBT health. At the time, they thought that systemic uh, prejudice shortens the life of LGBT people by 12 years. Mm. And then they reanalyzed their data and they said, oh, no, sorry, we were wrong. We, we encoded the information incorrectly. It's actually not that bad or something like that. So I, I removed that slide. Uh, so there are similarities, there is trajectory, but I think it comes down to personal um, experiences of the patient himself. So I don't know if it answered your question a little, lot, rather long answer for, for that. Well, it, it, it's um, a very provocative issue and I think you've covered it very, very well. And especially when you discussed uh, early ways in which how AIDS patients were treated in the isolation. And of course, when you have sexual identity attached into it, um, it, it has a long lasting trauma. So the older adults now that are surviving weathered this whole crisis and this emergence and advocacy ultimately for rights. Did that, in a sense, add to their hardiness in this current challenge. Yeah, definitely. And, and as, as healthcare providers, uh, how do we promote hardiness? I think one of the ways to do that is to give people hope, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you give hope to people? You, I don't have a, a specific trick on how to do that, but uh, when, when you face to face with that patient, right? How do you, how do, you do that? How do you give someone hope? That's beyond the scope of this presentation, but um, that uh, brings me to the question here uh, uh, um, on the chat is, is there's so much to think about and do you have recommendation how to, out, to outreach those uh, LGBTQ population who are not connected with resources like SAGE? Great question. You know, um, think about where you live right now. You live in a building, is there a door next to you? Um, um, a neighbor, um, uh, have you seen them? Uh, have you, have, do, do you know uh, where they are and what the, uh, their uh, uh, scenarios, you know, the, the old fashioned way of, you know, checking on someone. Um, funny enough, uh, during the peak of the pandemic, my neighbor upstairs who is 90 years old checked up on me and not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> I got a note from, from my mother in my apartment. Says, hey, Fidel, I know you're a nurse. I hope you're okay. And I thought that's wonderful of of, <laughs> of him to do that. And uh, so, yeah, um, the old fashioned neighborly, you know, pick up the phone. And I think, uh, um, well, we we know that phone conversation is better than email, right? So. Um, it, it really is uh, great for uh, diminishing the impact of isolation. Um, mm -hmm. What can we do for those LGBT elders who have gone back into the closet later in life, right? There is this uh, uh, phenomenon of going back in the closet after being out, right? So, um, or they will be out and out of sight or are they out and visible, right? So that those are the things. So. This is a, uh, a thing to be addressed by the organization itself. So if you work in a, in a nursing home, right? So how do we prevent them from going back in the closet? Mm -hmm. We know that some of the workers sometimes might treat them differently. I, I recall this back in the, in the, in the AIDS uh, unit, you know, people would, uh, you know, say things like you have to repent before you get there because you know at the time people from death from diagnosis to death was rather fast and it was horrific to be to to, to see that right so um that's enough for you to clamp back in so having that openness having uh teaching yourself uh the vocabulary pronouns uh inclusive language uh, uh um training of of, of interprofessional training, I think uh, lots of us uh, can benefit from, you know, knowing what the social worker is doing, knowing what the dentists were doing. I don't know, uh, um, uh, Dr. Aves, if you remember the Kimberly Bergalis, uh, that, that, that patient uh, who uh, thought she got her HIV AIDS in the 90s uh, from the dentist and mm -hmm. she testified in Congress. I, 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 can, I cannot forget that image of her, uh, you know, so 
ill and uh, testifying in there and the whole scare about going to the dentist in, in 1990 or in 89. My cousin is a dentist, so I, I go to her and, uh, and back again in the AIDS pandemic, you know. So yeah, so Dr. Wu, you wanted to uh, make some comments, feel free. Yeah, I um, I have uh, just a quick comments then before I leave. This is a wonderful uh, presentation. But one comment I think that particularly that important for us to keep in mind is that when you think about many minorities that, uh, um, you know, these uh, LGBTQ from minority population deserve um, more attention. A lot of kind of culture are more stigmatized towards this. And um, so they may actually that facing kind of even double or triple the kind of uh, jeopardy to that. Think about stigmatization and the cultural kind of pressure to that. So yeah. great yeah. presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Yeah, the, the whole idea of layering uh, all these other uh, issues. So, but in the interest of time, um, I want to thank you all for uh, joining us in this uh, 60 minutes. And I hope it uh, would give us some uh, something to think about and uh, take onto our practice and into our professional and personal uh, experiences and lives. So thank you all. Thank you all for this opportunity. And thank you very much for a very thoughtful, comprehensive, and um, I, I think we've all learned more after having listened to you than uh, we knew at the very start. So mission accomplished. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh,